Hello, and welcome to Highland Church of Christ online worship service. We're so glad that you're able to join us online and to watch our services, and we can't wait for a time when you get to join with us back together in worship. Uh, we ask that right now, as we get ready to, to spend time focusing on God, that you do that. You put away everything else that, that may be a distraction in your home, from the TV remote to the, to the phone in your hand, and just focus on worshiping our Lord and bringing Him praises. On this fine Sunday morning, we ask that you join us in prayer at this time. Almighty God in heaven, 
You are a powerful God. You're a mighty God. We are so amazed at your majesty and your might. And we are thrilled at the opportunity to come together to worship you, to honor you, to praise your high and holy name. We pray, Father, first and foremost, that you forgive us of our sins. We're so thankful that we can be continually washed in the blood of the Lamb. In uncertain times, we ask you for your blessed assurance. Where there is fear, we ask that you give us courage. Where there is worry, we ask that you increase our faith. Today, we want to affirm that we trust you, we believe in you. Would you help us to wait patiently on you as we struggle through these times of uncertainty? We pray a special blessing to be upon the Highland Church of Christ and the work that is done in this community. We're thankful that we had our first on-site worship this past Sunday, and we pray a blessing to be upon the leadership of this church and the work that is done to reach out to lost souls in this community. May we always be on the lookout for the lost and the lonely and the left out. We pray, Father, for those who are suffering because of illness and, and that are in the hospital. We pray that our members would be lifted up. May they find peace and courage on their journey. Would you help them to contend uh, with their pain? Would you bless our members who are grieving, who have recently lost loved ones? We pray that you would heal their hearts as they go on a grief journey. And we pray for all the caregivers in our congregation and in our community. We pray a blessing upon them. Give them courage. Give them strength. Give them hope for brighter days. And we pray a special blessing to be upon the United States of America. May we unite together around the Word of God and find hundreds and hundreds of reason then to become united once more. We look forward to coming as, a, as an entire body to worship together in your house very, very soon. Lord, come quickly. Thank you for all the rich blessings of grace and mercy that you bestow on us. In Jesus' name, amen. He was born in an obscure village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. He then became an itinerant preacher. He never held an office. He never had a family, never owned a house. He didn't go to college. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 years old when the public turned against him. Twenty centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, 
all of the parliaments that have ever sat, all of the kings that have ever reigned, have not affected the life of man on earth as much as this one solitary life. So today, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, we remember this central figure of the human race. His name was Jesus Christ, son of Mary and Joseph. The angel told them, you will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Emmanuel, God with us, King, Ruler, Shepherd, the Good Shepherd, Son of David, Healer, Commander of winds and waves, the Lamb of God. So when we picture the three crosses on that hill of Golgotha, there were two that were guilty, but the one, that central figure of the human race who hung beneath them, between them, was not guilty. We were the ones who were guilty, but he was not. Divine love went first that day. It's all about that focus on the cross. Let's bow in prayer for the bread. Heavenly Father, it is with great joy that we approach the throne of grace, knowing that you will welcome us. So may we as worshipers be ready to greet you and to remember, Father, we admit we're forgetful creatures. So today on the first day of the week, we gather to remember the sacrifice of Jesus, cross, of Jesus Christ on that cross. As we take this bread, we pray that we will reflect on all that was done before the foundation of the world. This plan was put into place. We're so grateful for your divine love in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, would you join me in prayer for the fruit of the vine? Heavenly Father, we reflect back on the sacrifice that took place there on that hill. And we remember the Roman soldier who approached Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who had left his place on the throne in heaven and come down here and lived in human shoes and walked in human shoes all of his life. And how that spear went through the side of that God-man that day and out came blood and water. For the sacrifice of your blood, of the blood of Jesus, we are so grateful. We're, as we remember that example of divine love, that demonstration that was here for us to remember today, we thank you for it. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, may our minds reflect back on all that you've done on our behalf and we praise that what we pray that what we do today will bring praise and honor and glory to your name as we worship you in Jesus name amen thank you very much for participating in the lord's supper today with us we also have an opportunity to give of our means. One of the most incredible things that the Lord commands us is to be cheerful givers. And now is that opportunity. For those of you who have been giving online, we ask that you continue to do so. For those of you who are able to attend the church service in the building next Sunday, you can also set aside your contribution on that day as well. Let's enter into prayer for the contribution. Heavenly Father, it is with great joy that we take advantage of this opportunity to show and demonstrate our love back to you as we give of our means. We pray, Father, for the contribution that is made, 
that it may continue to bring praise and honor and glory to the name of Jesus, not only in our community and across our state, but all across the world to the wonderful works that are contributed to. We pray a continued blessing to be upon the Highland Church of Christ here in Columbia, Tennessee, as we do the work of the Lord. Father, be with us. Keep us safe in your care and keeping. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I have good news and I have bad news. Which one do you want to hear first? I've always been fascinated by that question. I think the way that we answer it maybe says something about our own personality. Uh, This past week, I came across some research done by the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology where they actually did uh, a review on three studies that were performed to, to try to discover what people's preferences are when they are given kind of uh, this this uh, decision to make. Would you like the good news first or would you like the bad news first? And I found it kind of interesting that 78% of people who were surveyed, they wanted the bad news first. And the reason they said that was because they felt like if they got the bad news out of the way, then the good news would enhance their mood or at the very least they wouldn't be left on a downer. But there were some people who said they'd rather have the bad news last and the good news first. And the reason they said they they wanted it in that order was because they felt like if they got the bad news last, it would motivate them to maybe change their behavior in some way. So let's just ask ourselves. Let me ask you, do you want the good news first or do you want the bad news? I think biblically, Both good news and bad news are incredibly vital to our understanding of biblical doctrine. And in fact, as we think about foundational principles, we find the good news very often is in balance with and in tension with uh, the bad news, the good news and bad news that go together. And so one of the texts that we'll look at this morning as uh, one of our foundational passages of Scripture is Romans chapter 5, verse 8, well-known verse where Paul writes and he says, God has shown his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Here we see the good news and the bad news in perfect balance. God loves us. Christ died for us. Those are good news items for us. But the bad news is we are absolute sinners. Uh, many years ago, I uh, um, encountered a uh, lady who, who had some things to say to me after a class, and she wanted to talk to me, and she had this tension in her heart where she was talking about the fact that she understood that, uh, you know, biblically, we are sinful people, 
And I remember she said, I know I'm a vile, horrible, disgusting person. <laughs> I thought, those are really, those are really, you know, steep words to use for yourself. And she said, I'm a vile, horrible person whose good works are like filthy rags, according to Scripture. Uh, it was a very eloquent uh, and brutal way to, to talk about herself. But she said, I also know that Christians in the Bible are supposed to be filled with joy and thanksgiving and to know that we're children of God. So how can I balance these two things out? How can I be humble and realize that I'm sinful and at the same time understand that I'm loved and to rejoice over that? That's a good question. I think uh, I might not have phrased it quite the same way, but it's an interesting question. There's a famous author in our day and age, a modern uh, Christian author by the name of Tim Keller, and he's, he's famous for writing these words, which I'll give to you right now, where he says, The gospel is this, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe, yet at the very same time we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. And I think that's a powerful statement. I think it's powerful because with that statement, you don't become unrealistic about either of those two things. You don't become unrealistic about your sin, and you don't become unrealistic about the the power and depth of grace in your life either. And so this is a a great perspective-setting way of talking about the gospel. That there's sort of this double edge to the gospel. That we're more sinful than we could ever know and more loved than we could have ever dreamed. And I think that's maybe a key. Understanding these two things in balance, the good news and the bad news, that's key to keeping ourselves humble. Knowing we're sinful and yet not despairing over that because God values us. And yet, in knowing how much we're valued by God, we don't become prideful because we have both of these things in balance. So let's think about these two items for just a few minutes as we study together. The first part of that formula that we just talked about is this. You are more sinful than you ever thought. And the Apostle Paul is really skilled at bringing the Hebrew Bible to bear using Scripture and quoting from the Old Testament to prove that we are, in fact, very sinful as human beings. In fact, in Romans chapter 3, he quotes from the Old Testament more times than in any other place in his writings to prove that very fact that we are sinful people. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul writes, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one truly seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless No one does good, not even one. And then he goes further. Verse 13, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of snakes is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And their paths are ruin and misery. And I want to hone in on the last two verses here. Verse 17, the way of peace they have not known. And then in verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. For someone with a Hebrew background like Paul, the way of peace, that came from the idea of shalom. It meant that no matter what was going on in your life, how bad it was, God was present with you through every moment of that. And so you could have sort of a peace of mind or a peace that passed all understanding. It wasn't a promise that nothing bad was ever going to happen to you. It simply meant God was always going to be with you every step of the way through it. And so people... Paul says, whose lives are just immersed in sin, they have no sense of that peace that God is with them. And furthermore, verse 18, there's no fear of God before their eyes. And so the idea of the fear of the Lord in the Old Testament, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, we're told, uh, in some of the wisdom literature in the Bible. And that's, that comes from a word, yare, which means you are in awe of God and you revere him, but you also cherish him and love him. And all of that's sort of mixed together. And so verses 17 and 18 are a big indictment on me and you, that there's no peace and there's no fear or reverencing or even love of God in our lives. 
Isaiah 64, verse 7 repeats some of these same ideas. It says, There's no one who calls upon your name who rouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. So here's the bad news. You, me, not anybody, has ever gotten to the bottom of our sinfulness. You are, in fact, more sinful than you ever thought you were. It's worse than you think. But here's the flip side of that statement, and it's what makes that dark background we just talked about bring this truth to the forefront to shine out like a star. And it's the second part of that formula, that you are more loved than you could ever dream. See, the truth of the matter is that your sin has been paid for at infinite cost. And that was through the blood of Jesus Christ being shed. Jesus' blood is of such infinite worth that God has shown through the shedding of that blood how valuable you are to him. And that this blood shedding is a free gift done by Jesus that you did not deserve but he delighted to give it to you because you are so valuable. What great news. And I think that that's you know, communicated in, in no greater way than in John 3.16, a verse that you know like the back of your hand. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I wonder when you've looked at John 3.16, have you ever looked at the little two-letter word, so, where it reads, for God so loved. You know, according to uh, the Greek text, the word so there doesn't mean this is how much God loved you. In fact, the adverb autos simply means this is the way in which God demonstrated his love. Obviously, God loves you so much by virtue of the fact that Jesus died for you. But in fact, what the verse is saying is, here is irrefutable proof. God so, in this way, loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so one translation has it this way, for this is the way God has loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that anyone who believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So embrace this. God wants to love you. He wants to shower his love upon you. Let yourself see the fullness of the sinfulness of your sin, but on the other side of that, remind yourself that there was an infinite cost paid. And don't dishonor the Lord's sacrifice by holding on to the guilt he has paid to remove. So I want you to think about it. Consider this. He loves you. He values you. He is making you into his child. He's taking you into his family. You don't deserve any of it. It is a free blood-bought gift overflowing from the, the heart of God. And he loves to give it to you. So from these three foundational texts, Romans 5.8, Romans 3.10, and John 3.16, we learn the truths of this statement. That you are more sinful than you ever thought, and you are more loved than you could ever dream. But let's take just a minute to think about it a little bit more deeply. Because the person that I had the encounter with brought up our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. And I want to set that in, in the proper context. Isaiah 64 and verse 6 says, We've all become like one who's unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. I want you to know that in the context in which Isaiah is writing, Isaiah 64, 6 does not mean that all righteousness that we do is unacceptable to God. Isaiah is talking about the people who claim to follow God, but in fact they were very, very hypocritical. What God is really saying is he thinks that when people try to do righteous deeds in a hypocritical way, it's a filthy thing before his eyes. And that leads us, I think, to a third thing we might add to our original statement. Yes, it's true. Our sin is worse than we ever imagined. And yes, it's true that God loves us more than we ever dreamed. 
But the third thing we might add to that is that God expects his now forgiven people, God expects his people to reflect him in their actions. And so in the verse right before the one we were just looking at in Isaiah 64, 5, Isaiah says that God is very approving of those who joyfully work righteousness. In other words, they're not being hypocritical about it. God's producing a fruit in their lives. So I just just think about it. Bec- you know, you have this knowledge that you are worse than you ever dreamed, but God loves you more than you ever realized. And based on that, our lives should change. Our goal then should be to know God accurately in the way that we think and to enjoy Him intensely in our emotions and reflect Him consistently every day in our lives through our actions. Here's how Paul prays for us. He says in Philippians 1, 10 and 11, he has this, this written prayer. He says, his prayer is that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And then in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, he, he writes this. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So the expectation is that you're going to be producing, as Paul just wrote, the fruit of righteousness. And there's no way we would ever go to Isaiah 64, 6 and say that that God producing fruit of righteousness in our lives, that that's to be compared with something that's filthy before his eyes. Yes, it's true. None of our good deeds are ever perfect. But God doesn't call his own spirit-created fruit in our lives filthy. The truth is, if we're in union with Jesus, our imperfections are covered by Jesus' blood. And that's how you know God and Christ can delight in the good things that we do because of our awareness of what he's done for us. So 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus his Son, cleanses us from all sin. So there's a sense in which we should shout from the rooftops, Christ died for us to do good works. Echoing Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. So let's make it very crystal clear that the blood of Jesus is given to cover our sins, but also to create good works in our lives. And now because of that, it's possible for Jesus in all of his holiness to delight in us as we live our lives for him. So take these foundational thoughts, these principles to heart. You are, in fact, more sinful than you ever thought. And yet you are also, in fact, more loved than you ever dreamed. And because of these two things, God expects his blood forgiven people to reflect him in their everyday lives. Your God delights in you. You should dwell in the wonders of his grace. And the fact that you're unworthy of that should just heighten your praise. Because it is God's pleasure to give his kingdom to you. Let's pray about it. Father, we come before you today so very thankful for your grace, for the accomplishments of your Son. May we treasure these things in our hearts. May we humble ourselves before you, knowing how very much in need of you we are. And may we live our lives accordingly and change our behavior. It's in the name of Jesus we pray it. Amen. Thank you today for worshiping with us. Our prayer is that you're enriched by the Word of God every time that you open up His Word. And if you have any needs, we stand ready to help you. Don't hesitate to call one of our elders, one of our ministry staff. We're always available, and we pray for you every single week. We're thankful for you. Keep looking up. Amen.